For our experts in emotion interview, we'll be speaking with Dr. Yuta Yorman on depression and emotion in adults. So Dr. Yorman's research focuses on the integration of basic and clinical science to gain a better understanding of how basic cognitive processes and individual differences in emotion and mood regulation increase the risk for the onset of depression and anxiety disorders and hinder recovery from these disorders. Specifically, she investigates how attention and memory processes are linked to difficulties in the use of emotion regulation strategies, thereby maintaining negative affect and contributing to the risk for emotional disorders. She received her PhD in 2000 from the Free University of Berlin in Germany and worked as a research associate at Stanford University. Currently, she's an associate professor at the University of Miami and will soon be a professor of psychology at Northwestern University. She's an associate editor for the Journal of Abnormal Psychology and importantly, spending time with her two-year-old daughter, Ella, is her favorite and most effective way of regulating affect and recovering from stress. So I now turn to a very special experts in emotion interview with Dr. Yuta Yorman. So welcome, Yuta. Thank you for speaking with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Oh, thank you. Um, what I'd love to ask you about, just to get started, is sort of your journey into the world of emotion and really what sort of piqued your interest in the first place. Kind of where did you get started in this field? Well, that's a great question. Um, and I could go on for a very long time um, <laughs> answering this. But um, I'm actually trained as a clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of my interests really um, you know, come from my training and my experience is working with patients and mm -hmm. I was very interested um, in depression research from the start and you know the, how, the main symptoms of depression are sustained negative affect and difficulties experiencing positive affect and so this shows that it's all about emotion um, you know people experiencing maladaptive emotions for you know a very long time um, not being able to regulate them and you know, having having these really long-lasting negative affective states and difficulties experiencing positive affect, um, so that really got me interested in trying to understand, you know, what this is. Why do people have difficulties? Why can't they recover from stressors? You know, why do these stressors have these really long-lasting effects on them? Um, and so I got, you know, I got really interested in understanding what emotion is all about because not just in depression research, but really if you look across all the emotional disorders. That's why they're called emotional disorders, right? It's all <laughs> about emotion and difficulties regulating emotion. Um, and so really from the clinical perspective, um, this was really what piqued my interest in, in getting, you know, to understand this a little bit better. I mean, and since then, I mean, you've really paved the way for much of our understanding about the nature of emotion regulation and mood disorders and how that relates to cognitive processes. And in particular, I mean, you're widely known for your influential work. I'm a big fan of it personally. Um, that takes this multi-method approach to identify cognitive processes associated with emotion and mood regulation and depression. And I wonder, from your perspective, what you see as some of the kind of, you know, signature cognitive processes that seem to be uniquely involved in depression. Um, yeah, we have a number of cognitive processes that play a role, but the mm -hmm. question, you know, what of the, which of these are really unique to depression, mm -hmm. that's a very difficult one to answer. And, you know, I wish we had, we had better answers um, to this at this point in time. So this is still ongoing, ongoing mm -hmm. research. Um, but, you know, we, we're definitely making progress um, on that end. Um, as you, yeah, as you know, depression is characterized by cognitive biases. Um, and if you've ever worked with a depressed, depressed person, um, you know, they become very, very obvious from the start, right? People may come in and, you know, you've spent an hour talking to them about all their accomplishments and achievements. And then next time they come back and they say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a complete loser. I can't do anything right. Um, and you think, oh, what's going on, right? We were just talking about all these wonderful accomplishments that you had in your life. Um, so there's something definitely going on cognitively, um, and these cognitive biases, so difficulties, um, you know, recalling positive things that happen to people in their lives, um, being really focused on negative interpretations, you know, having difficulties, you know, going beyond that and to see that there are other ways in which events could be interpreted. Um, and, you know, um, attention biases, so a focus you know, on the negative aspects of situations, even though, again, there would be, you know, di many different interpretations of a given event. Um, and so these cognitive biases that focus people's attention, 
and on the, on the negative aspects of situations um, really seem to be playing a role in depression. And this seems to be something that is um, in part specific to depression. Um, for example, the memory biases for negative information so that people you know, tend to recall all the negative things that happen, have difficulties recalling positive events, is something that we you know, mainly find in depression. Um, whereas you know, biases towards um, threatening information is something that we may find in anxiety disorders. Um, biases towards attending um, negative material is something we may find in depression, but depressed people seem to be more characterized actually by difficulties disengaging their attention from negative material. Um, and so there is some specificity here um, and you know that definitely plays a, a big role because it will determine how people will interpret initially um, the situation that elicits the emotion. And so they're more likely to experience negative affect because they you know, have negative interpretations. Um, and then on the other hand, they also seem to have difficulties overriding these first interpretations. Um, that's often what we call difficulties in executive control or cognitive control. Um, so basically the first interpretation that comes to mind basically stays with people um, instead of you know, going back and rethinking, is this really how I should be thinking about the situation? Um, you know, that seems to be a very hard thing to do. They're less flexible cognitively um, to, you know, to rethink um, interpretations and take other information into account. Um, and so there's, it's basically those two sides, right? We have a lot of cognitive biases, and then we have cognitive control deficits that make it hard to override the biases. Um, and so people end up you know, in negative interpretations that will stay with them and create long-lasting negative affect. I mean, so everything you're saying is really interesting about trying to unlock the cognitive processes that are involved in depression and the way that they relate to, you know, difficulties with emotion and emotion regulation. I wonder if you think that we're at a point right now in the literature that we can translate these findings, a lot of the ones that you've pioneered especially, um, towards better understanding, you know, issues such as, you know, differential diagnosis or treatment. Yeah, that's definitely the next step, and you know we're working on that as other groups um, out there who look at cognitive processes and emotion um, in psychopathology. Um, and there are some interesting developments um, that are very, very promising. Um, in terms of differential diagnosis, I already said that we think that some biases, for example, are specific to depression. We won't find them as easily in other disorders. However, it seems like at this point there is more actually that cuts across different emotional disorders. Um, mm -hmm. you know, but I think it helps us a little bit to better understand, for example, what depression is all about you know, compared to anxiety disorders, such as that depressed people have these difficulties with cognitive control you know, that comes with the cognitive biases, and so they sort of get stuck on negative material and can't use positive material to repair negative affect. Um, however, I think there's still a lot to do um, you know, when, you, when it comes to differential diagnosis. Um, the, other, the other question about intervention, um, one thing that people are working on right now is to more directly target these cognitive difficulties that we find in people with depression, um, for example, through training paradigms. Um, there are some really interesting studies that have you know, started to train attention biases, for example, to try to make people focus on positive material instead of negative material. Um, and the initial findings from these studies are very, very promising. Um, there are also trainings now for memory biases and interpretation biases in depression. Um, and so it seems like, you know, that's some really very easy to do computer programs, you know, all you have to do is basically play them, um, you know, half an hour every day. Um, and the result, initial results seem, seem to show that this really helps um, with, you know, with symptom, um, you know, with, um, with reducing symptoms of depression and things like that. Um, there are also trainings out there now very specifically focused on executive control processes. Um, those are really, really interesting too. Um, so it you know, helps people to, for example, train their ability to disengage from negative material, um, you know, to recall um, you know, more positive information and things like that. Um, and so that's you know, a very interesting step forward. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there's more, more to come in, in the next years from this area of research. Okay. So the other question I just wanted to ask you a bit about is you've also ex investigated the intergenerational transmission of depression from you know, mothers to daughters. And I wonder if you could say a bit about what are the key findings that have emerged from this really promising and interesting line of work. Um, yeah, we, we know that daughters of depressed mothers are mm -hmm. at you know, significantly increased risk to develop depression themselves. Um, it's about six to seven times elevated. Um, 
And the problem is that at this point, we really don't understand why this is the case. Um, what it is that actually sets these girls, it's usually girls, it's also boys, um, but actually the risk is a little higher for the girls. Um, and so it, you know, we don't really understand what sets the girls up for this elevated risk. Um, and so what we did in the study is to really use a multi-method approach. Um, so we use you know, cognitive tasks, again, looking at cognitive biases, executive control, um, we use brain imaging um, to, look, to look at emotion regulation and reward processing in the girls. Um, we also look at stress reactivity and we're using cortisol um, and psychophysiolo uh, psychophysiological measures. Um, so it's a very multi-method approach that we're um, using for these girls. And um, we're already in, you know, in the cross-sectional data finding differences between the high-risk and the low-risk girls. And again, we're, we're recruiting girls who are at risk just because their mothers had depressive episodes during their lives. But the girls have no history of psychopathology, um, no, no elevated um, scores on any of the self-report measures or anything like that. Um, so it's a real high-risk sample. Um, so it's very, it was very fascinating to us to see that already in the cross-sectional data, these girls differ. Um, for example, they show some of the cognitive biases that we find in the adult depressed people. Um, they're more likely to orient their attention to negative material, they're less likely to orient to positive material. They have difficulties recalling um, negative, um, positive um, words that describe themselves, um, and they have a you know have a bias to recall negative words that describe themselves. Um, so that was very interesting to see. They also re re um, respond with more cortisol to a stressor, um, and um, we also find diff differences between these two groups in brain imaging, um, so in neural correlates of um, emotion emotional responding and emotional regulation. Um, and we now have the first data coming in for the longitudinal findings. And a lot of the measures actually do predict the first onset of depression in the world. Um, so that's going to be very interesting. Um, you know, things like, for example, cognitive biases predict um, and um, the cortisol reactivity which is to predict the first onset of depression um, in the world. So this is going to be really interesting because this will really point us to real risk factors for the first onset of depression. Because again, the girls have no history of psychopathology. Um, and so this will hopefully really um, give us a, a good idea and inform you know, prevention and intervention efforts in the future. That's fantastic. So you're able to take these laboratory findings and really translate them towards developing models of risk for the onset of depression, which to date has been a really difficult you know, undertaking uh, to embark upon, and it sounds like you have some really promising findings in that vein. Yeah, definitely, and um, you know, it was a very difficult study to do, um, but we're very happy we did it because we think that the results are going to be very, very interesting. So the last question I wanted to ask you is about your work that's also looked at sort of key cognitive and emotional processes and disorders that are commonly comorbid with depression, such as social anxiety disorder. And I wonder if you could say just a bit about um, what do you think are some of the central sort of emotional or cognitive processes among individuals with social anxiety disorder in the work that you've done? Um, yeah, we've looked at, you know, again, with this idea, what are things that are very common um, across depression and social anxiety and things that may actually, you know, differentiate the disorders mm -hmm. um, because they're very highly comorbid. Um, so, you know, there's almost like a 60% chance if you have a diagnosis of depression um, that you will also have a diagnosis of social anxiety disorder. Um, mm -hmm. And we know that social anxiety disorder often precedes the onset of depression. So often, you know, we have social anxiety disorder in children, um, and then this will go on to depression in adolescents and adults. Um, so there seems to be a very close link um, between the two disorders. Um, and when we looked at cognitive processes, for example, we found that there are some biases that are overlapping, for example, in attention, but also some biases that seem to be very, um, you know, seem to be separate um, and that seem, you know, mostly related to depression, but not as much to social anxiety. Um, so hopefully this will again inform, you know, some first our understanding of social anxiety as a risk factor for depression, um, but also um, what we can do, um, you know, to to really treat depression because if we manage to actually treat social anxiety in the children, we may have a very very effective prevention tool um, for depression onset in um, adolescents and adults. Um, one study that we did, for example, was to look at emotion regulation in social anxiety versus depression. Um, and the results there were very, very interesting in that 
um, depressed people were most likely to ruminate and they had a, a lot of difficulties to reappraise, um, so to find new interpretations for an emotional eliciting situation. Um, whereas that actually wasn't as big a problem in social anxiety. Um, what people in social anxiety did um, was a lot of express, expressive suppression. Um, so they didn't, basically didn't want people to see what kinds of emotions they were they were experiencing. Um, so this, you know, could you know hopefully again help us to better understand how the uh, how the disorders are related um, and are different. Well, thank you so much for answering all these questions today, and thank you for speaking with us. Um, what I'd love to ask you a bit now um, that you've shared these really important insights from your work is where you see the face of the future headed in emotion. If you had to project, where do you see important, you know, movements going towards? I think, um, you know, this is not really very novel anymore, but the inclusion of the idea of emotion regulation, you know, that people don't just experience the emotions, but they, they are very active in responding to them and trying to change them. Um, I think that is definitely something that will not go away in the future and where we will have more and more interesting findings um, on how this, for example, relates to psychopathology. Um, because a lot of psychopathology may not actually be difficulties with emotions, but difficulties with the regulation of the emotions. Um, you know, for example, in depression, we think that people may not differ so much in how they respond to a stressful event. Um, but that depressed people have a, have a very difficult time shutting off that emotion because they're using the wrong strategies. Um, and so the focus on emotion regulation is definitely a focus that will be very, very important in the future. The other thing that I think is very important is to think um, that emotion is a very complex construct. Um, so we are more and more moving towards a multi-method assessment of emotion. And I think that that will be very important to keep in mind. And we will see more biological studies um, and more studies looking you know, at biological correlates um, of emotion um, and how those are related to subjective experience. Um, and, um, you know, particularly uh, more brain imaging studies, um, you know, studies on, you know, endocrine, endocrine function, psychophysiology and how that goes together um, with emotion experience. And those kinds of studies also will be very, very important to, you know, move the field forward. And when you think of sort of leading the field forward. Um, a big part of this will also be done by students, some of yours right now, and some of those that are just thinking about embarking on the study of emotion. And so what advice would you have for students who are, you know, contemplating pursuing this field of emotion? Yeah, very closely related to um, what I just said, I think it's going to be very important um, mm -hmm. to think of this as a complex construct that will need a multi-method approach. Um, so I think, you know, for all you students out there who are really interested in emotion research, I think to get trained um, on very diverse measures um, of affect, because again, it will, you know, we, we have a lot, relied a lot on self-report, um, but that will not be, be sufficient anymore given, you know, and technical developments and developments in you know theories of emotion and assessment of emotion. Um, so some training in brain imaging definitely is going to be something that will be very useful. Um, and you know just everything you can do to approach this complex phenomenon from different directions um, and to look at the divergence and you know um, of, the, of these different methods um, will be very important. So just you know try to get trained as much as you can on biological as well as psychological assessment um, methods. For, you know, for this very complex contract. Great. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today, Yuta. Um, it was a pleasure to talk to you as always. Um, and this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Yuta Yorman from Northwestern University. Thanks again.